live. Hey guys, Ron from Ron Roy Law, and today we're going to be talking about a very important topic, and it's really just updated by the news. If you've been around commercial real estate or if you've followed what's been going on, you know that Sam Zell, the billionaire extraordinaire real estate mogul, has died. He was 81. Um, he died at his home. It was peaceful. But it's very, very interesting, I, I think, for what this means for the average commercial real estate investor. So I'm going to talk a little bit about who Sam Zell was. He is, is really an incredible person. He was very, very unique in 2023. He was still giving interviews. He was active. You know, he was still attending conferences and he was on stage after COVID and all this. But what he was known for was buying distressed properties. And, you know, he was the grave dancer, they said, because when things were at their worst, when income was down, when the tenants were all gone, he would come in and he would buy these properties. Not only would he buy one or two or three, he would buy a nationwide portfolio and he would buy at the bottom of the market and he would rebuild things and sell at the top. You know, I think it's that prototypical buy low and sell high. But the problem was he was buying when everybody else was scared, not just scared, but petrified. And people would say, there is no way to make money here. This is a dead piece of real estate. And he would say, no, I think it's an attractive basis. It's an attractive entry price. Um, he was trained as a lawyer. He spent one week in his law firm before he decided Practicing law was not for him. And so at that point, he had already been managing multifamily apartments. He owned uh, several hundred for himself personally. And with an investment from one of the partners, he very quickly grew into multifamily. Um, and again, he he bought and sold things before they were sexy. Um, so a lot of his criticism uh, you know, again, I, I don't know if it's fairly, I think it is, it is what it is. If you're doing something large, if you're doing something important, there are going to be critics. There are going to be people, detractors that don't like what you're doing. And I think that one of the messages beyond just, you know, the, the temporary or the fragility of life that we should live every day to its fullest put the finishing touches on your life this is my my stoicism philosophy coming in put the finishing touches on your life every night as if it were the last day if you wake up the next morning consider it a gift you could have ended your life last night and it's a very powerful way to live your life as if you're dying and i think that unfortunately for a lot of us people's death brings that to the forefront and we are reminded of how temporary our time is and whether we enjoy working for that boss that is you know making your life miserable if you died that night i think most people would regret spending a little bit more time in the office they would regret doing things that they don't love or they don't enjoy and maybe pursuing more passions, maybe investing in real estate, maybe spending more time with family, maybe spending more time working out and, and keeping your health up. But that is something that somebody's death and and certainly, you know, somebody in the industry as as large and well known as Sam Zell, it brings it to the forefront. And I think it kicks a little reminder and we get a little bump in how we view our time and and realize that on this earth it is the only thing that we have it doesn't matter if you have money it doesn't matter if you have all the material possessions the only thing that separates or that we have in common with other billionaires is time and how we choose to spend that time is really your own choice and and death can come it is uh uh memento mori Again, I'll go more into the stoicism. I think I've mentioned it, um, but it's really a great phrase. Um, it is a, a Latin phrase for remember that you have to die. And again, Sam Zell's timely or untimely passing should be a reminder to us all about spending the time you want to do before your inevitable death. At least at this point, even the richest billionaires, they can't prolong their life um, any much longer than uh, an average person. So 
Zelle had an estimated net worth of $5.9 billion, putting him in the top 500 richest people solely through commercial real estate. Really, uh, I think a powerful example that people say, oh, you've got to be in tech. Oh, you've got to go public. I mean, he had some public traits, but you can build an incredible fortune solely based on real estate. And that tears and that um, that is not just true at the top sections. You know, I think for SaaS companies, you, you do have to be at the top. You have to either own a company or you have to leverage other employees. You have to have some public interaction or markets. But in real estate, you can really build something incredible without any type of, of leveraging or well, I mean, I guess he has leverage through debt, but you don't have to build a huge company and you don't have to have it all in a windfall when your Amazon stock, for example, goes public. You don't need to have Under Armour go public and that's your your payday. You can build billions by billions up to you know a pretty large net worth. Um, that said, you know, he was very unique in 2023. He was a straight talker. Yeah, that was his book, Am I Being Too Subtle? He wouldn't hesitate to drop F-bombs. He would criticize the younger generation uh, for what he perceived as their shortcomings, but he would tell it to you straight. And I think it was very refreshing in the political world that we live in, where people are constantly trying to be all things to all people to grow market share and make more money. He didn't, he didn't need that, you know, and that was probably built on his uh, back of his company, but he could say whatever he wanted to say. And he would, he didn't care if he offended people. He um, was very blunt in his opinions, rightly or wrongly, but I, I think people appreciate that. And, and I certainly did. You know, I felt like he didn't have a motive. And again, let's let's compare. Here's an easy comparison that I, I like to make, uh, which is uh, Ray Dalio. He is very much somebody that um, I think is careful with his words in that he cares about what people think about him because he makes he spends a lot of his time in the public eye and he cares about what the mass, what the masses and the media think of him. So whether he's smarter or better, he's apparently worth 19 billion, according to Forbes versus Sam Zell's paltry 6 billion. And if you're just looking on a very weird objective scale, Ray's approach to finesse the markets makes him wealthier. He 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 obviously played in different areas and and he made different decisions. I don't know who's smarter, but just on those two metrics alone, you could say, oh, well Ray, you know, you can triple your billions if you are careful and if you are very thoughtful about your words. For most people, I don't think that matters. I think people looked up to Sam Zell because he was pure, because he said what was on his mind and there was a lot of respect. I think People don't really know who they're dealing with if they're dealing with a smooth talker, somebody who's a politician or or is just very careful about not saying things that they're thinking in their heart, but instead saying what appeals to most people. And so, again, for all of my my praise, I don't know if you can tell. I mean, I like the guy. I think Americans in general, too, they really revere or respect pure people. You know, the purest person that, you know, think about Rocky, who only cares about that fight. He doesn't do anything else. Think about the the football player um, blindside. You know, he's a kid. All he does is play football and that's his life. People really revere that. And Sam Zell was that same way in sense of he's pure to himself. He doesn't owe anything to anybody. He doesn't care about your opinion of him. He's going to say what he wants to say. But let's talk about some criticism. I, and I think it's fair that you're going to get criticism. I don't think anybody gets to be a billionaire without stepping on some toes. But, you know, he he bought a lot of mobile homes. He was very early. And, and that's a key takeaway for real estate investors to be early on the next asset class. When other people don't like an asset class, can you make money in it? And can you go, can you scale that asset class? So mobile homes, before they were a thing, he bought them in, in particular, I think, because he extracted more money from a vulnerable section of the population that was very um, 
you know, they had a uh, very inelastic demand. They couldn't move. And this was a, a quote. He said, what I've found is the customers are stuck there. They don't have the option. They can't afford to move the trailer. They don't have three grand. The only way they can object to your rent raise is to walk off. But that ends up leaving the trailer, in which case it becomes abandoned property. You recycle it. You put another person in it. So you really hold all of the cards. Now, if your if your reaction to that statement for people who are renting a trailer park and you have this vision in their head of this you know poor vulnerable population it's it's very interesting why do you have a problem with that discussion versus class b or even class a multifamily because there's that same analysis except it's a spectrum question and you really want sticky people and and I can really continue that analogy to even say industrial. If you have a large build out, if you have a custom TI package where the tenant is going to require $400,000 of custom equipment and they may ask the landlord to pay some of that, they become a sticky tenant. And you could, let's reread the quote. What I found is industrial tenants with large build outs are stuck there. They don't have options. They can't afford to move their equipment. This is manufacturing. They don't have. $300,000. They're a business. The only way they can object is to walk off and they 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 leave their equipment, in which case it becomes abandoned property and you recycle that equipment. You put another industrial tenant in it. So you really hold all the cards. That is true for all landlords, for anybody who has elastic tenants. And it's everything is a spectrum. So I guess I'm coming full circle again to praise the man present a, a, a slumlord opinion of him, but but I really don't think it is. You as an investor shouldn't worry about what other people are doing. You can only control your own properties and you choose to treat your tenants with respect, with dignity. You choose to be fair and I think reasonable with them and have a long-term mindset with whoever your tenants are. And that's the most that you can control. So, you know, I, I, I really want to kind of... Um, conclude this this podcast i think i have waxed philosophically on a lot of different points things that are that are really interesting to me and at the end of the day these are going to be things that help you sleep at night whether you make a billion dollars in commercial real estate or you make a hundred million dollars or you make a million dollars you have to make choices with the tenants with your rent increases but you owe a duty to yourself to the, your investors to really extract the maximum value from your property. And that's really just, I think, a fundamental assertion because you have a duty to extract the maximum income so that you have control of the assets to reinvest into the property to maintain those fences, to regrade the, the parking lot, to paint the exterior of the building, things that don't necessarily move the needle, but all factor into that pride of ownership. So that's it for this, uh, what is it, third or fourth in, in episode of the podcast. Thank you guys very much for listening in. Uh, Sam Zell's passing was untimely, but hopefully it can be a reminder and hopefully a longer lasting reminder to chart your day, but put the finishing touches every day as if it's your last because eventually that will come true. And I think we can all benefit from his passing and the lessons for real estate and, and life in general. So smash that like button and we'll see you next time.